absent. In just maybe 15 minutes, he lost the Holy Spirit. He lost the anointing. In 15 minutes, what took him 30 years to build up? Gone. Everything gone. And when he realized he had lost the Holy Spirit, before he could even cry for repentance, he was blinded. Both his eyes were gorged and taken out. This is what the devil does, you know. When you stray away from God, the first thing the devil do to you is blind your spiritual eyes. Blind the eyes of your understanding so that reason doesn't work anymore. Discernment doesn't work anymore. Understanding doesn't work anymore. You cannot listen to the Holy Spirit talking to you anymore because you become blind, deaf and dumb. This is what the devil does. We see that in the life of Samson. And he wallowed and cried in the Philistine jail for at least 18 long months. Now eventually, God's grace came upon Samson because we read that the Lord re-anointed him one more time but he was forgiven he was restored but he had to pay it dearly with the loss of his life he was no more restored back again he lost everything and the only way for his salvation to be sealed is by death so that he does not repeat the mistake again. You know, if you read the Bible in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, it is written there. The Apostle Paul was taken in the spirit to the Corinthian church and he saw some people sinning and he says he committed them into the hands of Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that their soul can be saved. Sometimes God allows this to happen. A premature death. About 15 years ago, I was invited to pray for a young man who was dying of AIDS in a hospital in a state of India called Sikkim. The capital city is called Gangtok. So when before I was ushered into his presence, his mother told me, when you pray for him, please don't mention the word AIDS. He doesn't know he has AIDS. Don't mention all that. I said, okay, just pray for his healing. I said, fine. So I went to the hospital room. I saw this boy, 24-year-old young man. Very, very handsome-looking young man. When I saw him, my heart broke to pieces. 24-year-old boy who's counting his last days now. And this boy, to make it worse, was he doesn't even know he was going to die. He just thought he's having some kind of an illness and some kind of sickness and he needed some treatment. So after small talks were over, the time came for prayer. So when I closed my eyes to pray, I just could not bring myself to pray for him because seeing his very pathetic condition. I asked the Lord, how shall I pray for you? And then the Lord told me, don't pray for his healing because I have cursed him to die. But you pray that his sins will be forgiven him so that his soul shall be saved. Then I asked the Lord, what has he done, Lord? that he has been cursed to death and in one split moment the Lord showed me about his entire life what a grossly sinful life a lustful life this young man was living almost every day he will sleep with a girl being very young you know every teenage girl in the town every teenage girl in the college had been sexually violated by him. 
he used them and he dumped them. That was his flamboyant, playboy-like lifestyle. And way and behold, he was lived a godly life, totally away from his sins. So his flesh was judged and turned over into the hands for destruction so that the soul can be Such was the fate of Samson. He was judged, turned over into the hands of the devil for the destruction of his flesh so that his soul can be safe. Safe in heaven. You know, God values our souls more than our physical bodies. That does not mean God doesn't want to heal us. He wants to heal us. Now, during my 37 years in the ministry, praying for many, many people when they come for healing, there have been many, many times the Lord has told me, don't pray for their healing. And this is the reason why you should not pray for their healing, but pray that their sins will be forgiven them. I was once uh, invited to pray for a church elder, an Anglican church elder in our hometown. And when I went to see him, he was in his deathbed. You know, there was a huge five-footer oxygen tank beside his bed. And he was like kind of breathing his last. And uh, many of his brothers are pastors, some in Nepal and some in uh, other parts in India. So they all were expecting a supernatural hearing miracle when I prayed for the man. Of course, I went to that to pray for him expecting a healing to take place and when I saw him he was like you know anytime he could die anyway I knelt down beside him I began to pray every time I would say Lord heal him instead of the word heal the word forgive him Lord comes out of my mouth I said I should not be praying for forgiveness I should be praying for healing and this was repeated three times. No matter how hard I tried to control every vocabulary word that I would speak, even in slow motion. But when I come to the word heal, the word forgive comes out of my mouth. So I was wondering why is it that the word forgive is coming out of my mouth when I should be praying healing for this man. And then I asked the Holy Spirit, what is the problem here, Lord? And the Holy Spirit showed me his life. What You know, though he is a church elder, he is the most sinful man in our town and the greatest troublemaker to the church pastor. For every good thing the pastor does, he will be the first person to oppose the pastor. And he had an opposite camp. You know, like your Labour Party and Conservative Party two camps in the church and he was always will be opposing the pastor and besides that all kinds of lustful sinful habits he was practicing drinking smoking all kinds of stuff and now his entire body has been destroyed so the Holy Spirit told me don't pray for his healing it's too late now I'm going to judge him so you pray for his forgiveness so that his soul can be safe. And I began to pray for the man. And eventually, he died peacefully. But the soul has been safe. If it would not have been a big problem for God to do an instantaneous healing miracle for that man. But what will be their life after that? God sees the end from the beginning. The end should not be should not be worse than the beginning. If it is worse from the beginning, then you lose everything. You won't get a second chance. So to save us, sometimes the Lord allows the destruction of the flesh to take place. Thirdly, a church that has forgotten God, what will be the consequences? What would be the result that will happen to a church that has forgotten or turned her back against God? A very classic good example can be said of the church of Laodicea. 
in revelation chapter 3 verses 14 to 19 now that is the last of the seven churches that you read in revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 and the lord jesus christ looked at the church and he said i know your works i know what you are made of and he did not have any commendation or any compliments to give to this church perhaps all the other first six churches though they were at fault at least there was some good thing in them for the lord to compliment them but the laodicean church was not complimented the reason is because revelation chapter 3 verses 15 to 17 tells us she was following after vanity she was very rich she had all the goods she had everything that she could have for so why do you why do you need god why pursue after god when you have everything that money can buy now let me give you a very good classical classic example of an incident that I personally witnessed that will confirm this thing. In 1991, I met a family in the US. They had a son. And that boy, when he was born, had heart problem. He had four holes in his heart. And in the first three or four months of his birth, he had to go through four major heart surgeries. And the doctors told the parents, this boy may not live longer than seven months. This boy's grandparents are very godly people. I was staying with them in their house. And through their prayers, this boy lived past the seventh month. And by that time when I met the boy, he was 17 months old. Now to make a long story short, suddenly one day he just died when he was 17 months old so the whole family was devastated shocked I had the unfortunate experience of attending the funeral of this little boy that was the first time in my life I've ever seen a 17 month old toddler totally lifeless and dead that's the first time I ever touched a dead body in my hands. How hot and how cold the body was. So the funeral service finished. And after that, everybody gathered in the family's home to have tea and to have sandwich and biscuits. And the mother was sitting in one corner, young, young couple. She was weeping and weeping and crying. You know, when this boy died the very first minute when he died before the parents the mother called the ambulance she called me and she said please pray now my son has turned all blue over so I assured her my dear daughter don't worry I'll pray and as I was praying an angel appeared in my house carrying the boy in his hand so I looked at the angel and asked him why are you carrying that boy you are not supposed to carry the boy because I knew that when the angel carried the boy he was taking his spirit to heaven so I debated the angel you are not supposed to carry that boy he should leave and the angel looked at me and he just smiled and he said his time has come and I'm taking him home and soon after the angel disappeared five minutes later the mother called me to say the boy was totally dead so anyway after the funeral at their home I consoled the mother by recounting this incident I said this is what I saw so your son is safe in heaven one day you will meet him you know those kind of words they are comforting words but they are not consoling to a grieving parents right they are so broken and devastated and before I left the house that day I looked at the mother and the father and I told them I will pray ardently for you 
Now that was September of 91. Before the year ends, I will pray and I will ask the Lord to bless you so that you will conceive again. She looked at me and said, are you really sure? I said, this is a promise. I will pray for you very, very ardently. And saying that, I left, came back to India and I prayed for the family. On December the 24th of that year, I received a phone call from my husband saying, my wife has conceived. So they were so happy and she gave birth to a beautiful baby girl with clean, perfect heart. So they were so happy. The girl came to wipe away all their tears of their loss. And the following year, she conceived again. And she gave birth to twins. So the family was so happy. Now, for one loss, they've got three children. Two years later, she conceived again. And she gave birth to another baby. So now she've got four kids for one loss you get four in return see when you give one away you got four in return so you're so happy all the four children two girls and two boys they all have perfect heart no holes in the heart wonderful strong hearts and as they were blessed with babies the husband was also blessed in his career he's a computer engineer so he got promoted from one level to another level to another level. So as they were promoted, see, their family were blessed. They were materialistically blessed. So they began to buy a bigger house. More children came, bigger and bigger and bigger until they had like a palatial huge house. All this while, you know, when the first baby was born with a heart condition, that was the time they totally committed themselves to the Lord. And they began to pursue of the God from then onwards. And even after the first baby died, they pressed on with God. They did not turn their back on God. However, as they were materialistically blessed, their love for God began to get colder. And they were sliding down by stages. Eventually, with the four children, with three cars, big house, they totally stopped attending church. So when the pastor once asked them, why are you no more coming to church? You know what they said? They said, Pastor, we have everything. Why do we need God? Well, and then people become very spiritual, you know. They said, Pastor, the Bible also says, wherever two or three are gathered, Jesus is there. So me, my husband, my four children, there are six of us, two times more than what the Bible says. So we are praying in our home and Jesus is there. Why go to a church? That is their reasoning. They totally stopped attending church and they totally forgot God. This is or this was the attitude of the Laodicean church. They were materialistically well. They had everything that money can buy. So their hearts became cold. They were not hot. They were not cold. They were just indifferent. Lukewarm. Now what is the consequence of that? The Lord Jesus looked at them and said, You are wretched. You are miserable. You are poor. You are naked. And worst of all, you are blind. You think you are very rich, but you are wretched. You think you have all the goods in the world, you have all the happiness. Wrong. You are miserable. You think you have a lot of money in your bank account. Wrong. You are poor. You think you are dressed in all the fine clothes that money can buy. Wrong. You are naked. You think you are seeing everything. Wrong. You are blind fool. This was how the Lord Jesus assessed the Laodicean church. If the Lord Jesus were to come to your church, how would he assess your church? Like the church of Ephesus 
of the church in Agaman, Tiatira, Sardis, Smyrna, Philadelphia, or Laodicea. How will he judge your church? Or look at you as an individual. When the Lord Jesus looks at you, how will he assess you? As someone who is madly in love with the Lord and following him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, or someone who is just merely practicing religion. How will he assess you? You know what is merely practicing religion? But we don't even carry our Bibles to the church. Because the church projectionist is projecting all the scriptures on the wall. Why carry a Bible? Logical? Isn't it logical? Why carry the Bible heavy weight, you know? Let's lose some weight. Because they are showing the scriptures anyway. Why is turn the scriptures when you don't even know where is Revelation chapter 25? Right? You know, there was once in a church, I asked them, please turn your Bible to the Revelation chapter 25. Everybody put Bibles looking for chapter 25. And then when they found out that there was only chapter 22, they said, sir, there's no chapter 25. I told them, oh my God, there's a misprint in your Bible. They said, oh really? See how pathetic it is. Is our lives like that? How will the Lord Jesus judge us? My dearly beloved brothers and sisters, this evening, as I was waiting on God, this is the counsel the Lord gave you. What should you do? What should the church in Great Britain do? Seven things. The Lord is calling you to do seven things. He's calling you back to Himself. Come back. You know the proponents for leaving the EU says we should be our own we should stand our own two feet we should be ourselves so what they were actually doing is calling the nation back from the clutches of the EU back to our own identity you know it is so prophetic you know whatever has happened in your nation is very very prophetic to what God is calling you so what God is calling you is what has happened in your nation these past few days. So God is calling you back. Seven things you should do. Number one, come back to your first love. That's the first thing you should do. Analyze your heart. How is your love attitude with the Lord Jesus? Has it Increase or is it slided down from the day that you were safe till today? How much have you grown or how much have you backslided? If you have backslided today, make up your mind to come back or to go back to your first love. Go back to your beginnings. Call to remembrance the day that you first got saved. Go back to that day and restart all over again. That's the first thing. Secondly, fear not persecution or imprisonment that will come. Now this is something the Lord Jesus told me address to all the ministers who are in our midst. There will be laws enacted in this country to persecute and to imprison church and church leaders. Laws will be designed, laws will be enacted to do that. And God is saying to you, fear not the persecution, fear not the imprisonment, be faithful 
even unto death it, even if it means to lay down your life for the lord be faithful even unto death you know in revelation chapter 6 verses 9 to 11 says when the fifth seal was opened the apostle john saw many many martyred souls who were crying out to god and the lord came and consoled them and he said just be patient a little while longer for more of your brethren are also going to be martyred for the number of martyrs needs to be fulfilled till then be patient just rest a while so there is a certain number apportioned by god why it is necessary i don't know but the bible says it is necessary martyrs need to lay down their lives like what john chapter 12 verse 26 tells us a corn falls down to the ground when it falls on the ground and it dies it will bring forth more fruit like i shared with you this past two days there are many many british missionaries and scottish missionaries who came to india and they died serving god in india none of them went back home and their graves can still be found in india till today as a result of their lives i don't think they all died a martyr death but you know they gave up the comfort of their home they gave up the comfort of their families they gave up the comfort of this wonderful country and they came to a backward nation a nation where there is no good toilet facilities not today but this is we are talking about 100 150 years ago you know where there are no good roads people walk on barefoot these missionaries adapted to all those lifestyles here you have four seasons in india we don't have four seasons especially in south india it's one hot sunny burning climate for 10 months of the year these missionaries endured all that and there is no good medical hospitals no medical treatments when mosquito bites you you contract malaria tuberculosis and all diseases and there were no medicines many missionaries and their families and their children are buried because of sicknesses even in the midst of all that that did not deter them to go back home they served god there the place of their call they gave their lives as a result of that among the whole of india tamil nadu state has the largest population of christians largest churches and the most missionary sending centers and mission organizations are all based in that state firstly because the apostle, apostle thomas was martyred in tamil nadu state the blood of one disciple of the lord jesus and then the lives of the many many missionaries so when a martyr dies it's not death it's a sowing for a harvest so the second thing is fear not persecution or imprisonment will come be faithful unto death that does not mean you will be killed but in the eventuality of that you remain faithful not denying the lord thirdly come out of spiritual idolatry and the controlling of church members come out of idolatry any love extended to any object any person other than god is idolatry anything that comes between you and god is idolatry even your personal pleasure for rest that comes within you and god that is idolatry
and the controlling of church members the doctrine of Nicolaitans that should be cut loose church pastors don't own the church members no pastor has any right to say my sheep all believers are the sheep of the Lord Jesus Christ because only the Lord Jesus Christ is the great shepherd the bishop of our souls all we like sheep have gone astray and the great shepherd came to bring us back to himself so he is our shepherd every pastor is a custodian of the church you have to tend to the flock you have to feed the flock but we have no right to control the flock so that is what was practiced in the past which was what the Lord was against so in these last days we cannot do that because the Spirit of God is going to be poured out upon all flesh Joel chapter 2 verse 28 says upon your children upon your youths upon the senior citizens upon the ministers of God when the Holy Ghost full poise poured out upon the little children are we going to stop our little children from prophesying do you know that that's exactly what the Pharisees and Sadducees did in Matthew 21 when the Lord Jesus entered into Jerusalem you read that the children carried by their mothers were singing praises shouting crying praises glorifying the son of David as soon as the Pharisees and the Sadducees the established church leadership of that time heard that they told the Lord Jesus Jesus stop the children from praising you and do you know what the Lord Jesus told them he turned around and he said have you not read what the psalm says in 8 2 that the out of the mouth of babies and children he has perfected praise so their time has come to do their ministry you have no right to prevent them from doing their ministry your little children your babies your thoughtless and your little children 12 from zero age up to 12 years old they are going to prophesy they are going to see visions and they are going to cast out demons you will be the church leadership will be committing a grave sin if you forbid them from doing it because it's God who is calling them to do it and their destiny it is their end time destiny to rise up now why why the children in the last days for two reasons number one Exodus chapter 1 before Moses was born many many male babies were killed because of Moses secondly Matthew chapter 2 before or by the time the Lord Jesus was born he was about two years old for his sake many many babies two years old and below were all killed so the babies in Moses time and the babies in the Lord Jesus time they all died as martyrs they did not die for themselves they died for Moses who is like a savior to Israel and for the Lord Jesus who is the savior so the babies all died without seeing life so in these last days it is God's payback time Amen payback time it's payback time for all those souls that have been crying out to God for the last 3,000, 4,000 years when Lord when how long more will you keep silent on behalf of our souls they've been crying for the last 4,000 years 
so now the time has come to pay back so the very children that were killed god is going to pour out the seven spirits of god upon this little ones and they are going to take vengeance at the very demons that killed them in the first place amen so if that been the case when your little baby is going to prophesy or when your little baby suddenly gets up and say mommy i see an angel standing there please don't think your baby is nuts please don't think your baby is imagining things i have had many parents come and ask me you know my baby suddenly muttering strange things say what strange things oh my baby sees an angel everywhere he sees you know a little baby they cannot manufacture lies can they they cannot you know there's a good pastor friend of mine in india and uh, he has a daughter and a son and his daughter could not conceive a baby after 8 years of marriage so she will ask her father to pray for her every time and she will ask her father to ask me to pray for her so after 8 years of praying god bless her and she conceived and she gave birth to a baby boy so she lives in the us and she brought her baby to india to ask me to dedicate the baby for her so on the day of dedication as i was holding the baby in my hands and as i was praying the lord showed me the future of the baby how god is going to use the baby and uh, how he is going to grow up as a prophet of god so it was a long word that i gave to the baby for about maybe 15 minutes at the end of the 15 minutes the lord told me now in case his people all have a doubt that what you said is really from god tell them that god will give them a sign and the sign was this when the boy opens his mouth to speak the first word that he will speak is not mummy or daddy but it will be jesus is coming soon that will be the first sentence that will come out of his mouth so when he speaks that you will know that whatever was prophesied today is all from god so everybody was so happy they clapped their hands as the ceremony ended they went back home but the reverse happened for the first 3 years of the baby's life he never spoke a word so he was born dumb that's what they all thought they, the boy never spoke a word not even mummy not even daddy not even anything so the mother was very very worried first she was worried that she had no baby now she was worried worried that the baby was not speaking my own sister my older sister's son second son he never spoke for the first 5 years of his life so my sister was so worried for him she would pest me every day to pray for her son so i told her don't worry he is going to talk all his life at least let him be quiet for 5 years of his life so you know as an uncle i can say all that but a mother's heart is different but she would still pester me so one day he started talking and when he started talking then she called me and said please pray that he will stop talking so anyway this went on for this family and one day the mother heard some noise coming from the baby's bedroom she ran into the baby into the room and she saw her son three year old son standing on the bed pointing his hand at the roof and he said jesus is coming soon that was the first word that came out of his mouth the mother was shocked and surprised and a few other times he kept on repeating the same sentence over and over again jesus is coming soon and he before he ever spoke with the word mummy or daddy even when they taught him to say mummy or daddy he refused to say that and he keep on saying jesus is coming soon and that boy has been prophesizing ever since then small little boy he's 5 years old today and has never stopped prophesizing has never stopped seeing visions now who taught him all that it's not the figment of his imagination but according to the word of god that was spoken over his life the gifts are 
manifesting so how can we say this is of the devil or how can we say these are manufactured or these are unbiblical whoever wants to say that it is very similar to what the pharisees spoke during the lord jesus time concerning the little babies the mothers were singing the babies were all screaming and crying they were all not screaming and crying they were singing praises extolling and magnifying the lord jesus so don't control your church members when the spirits of the most high god are poured out upon your church number 4 Is that number four? Number four, stand against false teachings and false prophets that will come in your midst. One of the signs of the last days that the Lord Jesus told us in Matthew chapter twenty-four is deception that will come through false prophets and false teachers. So the fourth point is stand against false teachings. and false prophets that will come number 5 strengthen your faith now this applies to everybody strengthen your faith strengthen the things that are weak strengthen the things that will last for eternity the only thing that will last for eternity is your faith so strengthen your faith in good times when times of persecution comes you will not be able to attend a conference like this you may not even be able to attend your regular church meetings this bible may even be confiscated from you you know this is what happened in russia and china when you are deprived of all that all christian radio all christian tv stations barred all internet access barred what are you going to do you know in nations like iran in china they bar christian websites although not all many so the christians in those nations have no access to any christian materials on the internet so when that happens what are you going to do so strengthen the things strengthen your faith today so that when that comes you will be strong you will be bold Number six, guard your salvation, because during times of persecution, you will be tempted to give up your faith. You will be tempted, so guard your salvation, so that you will endure till the end. Number seven, re-establish your dependence on God. This was the problem in the Laodicea church. They had everything. They stopped depending on God. They depended on their own selves. You cast that away and re-establish your dependence on God. Now these are the seven things that you need to do to get back to God. In conclusion, let me answer the question about your present referendum. Now on the twin on the nineteenth of June, now this was four days before this nation went for the referendum. The nineteenth of June. Now till then I do not know all the complexities or the politics of Brexit. I only heard of the name Brexit. Every now and then it pops up on the internet. Every now and then it pops up in the newspaper. So all my knowledge about Brexit is. a referendum the nation is going to why they are going i didn't know oh i didn't bother to know but on the 19th of june when i was waiting on god when the lord gave me this word that i should bring to you during this conference and this was what the lord said about brexit he said the exit from eu is what is already written in Daniel chapter 7 and chapter 8 it's it's written in the scriptures thousands of years ago 
before you went to the polls on June the 23rd the decision that you made to exit is already written in the bible when they exit the eu they will be chastised by my love and restored back to my glory Now I want you to turn your Bibles to Deut- uh, to Daniel chapter 7. Now look at verse 4. There it describes how you will be chastised. There is a chastisement for all the sins that have been committed in this nation. Before you can be restored back to glory, first there comes a chastisement. Daniel chapter 7 verse 4. the first now the series of visions that the prophet daniel saw the first was like a lion and had eagle's wings and i beheld till its wings were plucked and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man now although this spoke of the nation of babylon in history concerning the end times this speaks about the great britain now the symbol of great britain is a lion and there you see this lion has eagle's wings during the great and mighty days of great britain it is said the sun never sets in in the british empire right so was you lifted up wings like an eagle and flew across conquering land after land after land so this is the this is your history now when you are chastised your wings are plucked now with all this threat of boycott that is coming from eu that you'll be out of this you'll be out of that all this threatenings and all the scare that is coming is what is written here the wings are plucked and it will be lifted up from the earth and made to stand upon the feet as a man now you stand on your own feet right when you do that now look at the next part